look at John chapter 6 for the third time now. This is our third session in this chapter. It is a long chapter. And it's not only a long chapter, but it's a chapter full of talk about deep subjects. And not only is it about deep subjects, but it's controversial talk about deep subjects. It was controversial when Jesus gave it. It has remained controversial ever since. Um, the portion we took last time was that portion which, which often provides uh, proof text for the Calvinist position about predestination, uh, irresistible grace, perseverance. And we talked about those verses so as to show that they really don't teach those doctrines and uh, it really wouldn't have made any sense for Jesus to try to make those points in this setting to these people anyway. And it is, there is always the danger that we will uh, look at a scripture uh, that sounds like it teaches something we want to believe or that we do already believe from some other source and uh, as a result see a proof text for that there but I don't believe that that is correct in, in the case of those verses we were looking at last time. Um, <clears throat> we're going to begin at verse 46 now and there's a different set of controversies that come up in modern times from this. Not only in modern times, it's a very ancient controversy that continues controversial. And that is what is meant by eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus. At verse 47, verse 46 actually, Jesus said, Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, Jesus has simply said at this point, he's giving his flesh, which means his body, for the life of the world. With no further explanation than that, we would assume that means he's going to die voluntarily and vicariously. To give one's flesh, to give one's body, would most naturally mean to die. Um, in uh, Mark, Jesus was quoted as saying uh, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life, a ransom for many. So Jesus predicted in other Gospels as well as this one that he would die, and that it would be a matter of giving his life for others, a ransom for many, as he put it. Now, that he would give his life means it's voluntary. He's going to die. Well, everybody dies, but not everybody voluntarily dies. He says he's going to give his flesh for the life of the world. Now, at this point, he hasn't got very explicit about eating his flesh, although it comes to that. He has said, I am the bread of life, and bread is something that is usually consumed. And he said, I'm the living bread. It's a very similar term. In verse 48, I'm the bread of life. In verse 51, I'm the living bread. And he says, if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Now, having said only that, the people began to wonder, what's he talking about eating his flesh, his bread, this bread that is his flesh? And Jesus starts getting not only more explicit, but more offensive in his language. Because he talks about drinking blood now, too. And to a Jew, very few things could be more abhorrent than drinking blood. I mean, they couldn't even have blood in their meat. The Jews had to buy their meat from kosher butchers or else butcher it themselves and drain all the blood out. Most people don't do that. They don't go to that trouble in preparing their meat. <clears throat> and besides, some people like the way meat tastes with some blood in it. So the Jews could not buy meat from normal meat markets in the, in the pagan world. They had, to, uh, they had to get it from a kosher butcher who would let it go. That little fly has taken a liking to me, I can see. <laughs> 
when Jesus said you have to drink my blood, as we shall see that he does, this, the idea of drinking blood was uh, just unthinkable to the Jews, of course, as it would be to us. Now, it isn't everybody. There's some parts of the world where they have blood soup. Germany has blood soup and they have blood sausage. And some people like blood. But uh, the Jews didn't like blood. I don't like that much blood. I don't mind my meat a little rare. But uh, I don't mind if there's a little blood in it. But, but the Jews were conditioned to be absolutely appalled by any blood entering their mouth. And so they said, how can this man give his flesh to you? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So he adds this blood part. He'd been talking about being bread. That's strange enough to their ears, to eat his flesh like bread. But now he adds something that he knows is going to offend them and drink his blood. Then he gets more offensive because he changes his verb in verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh. Now this is not the same verb that was used in the Greek in all the previous discussion about eating. This is a new verb which is, means to chomp or to munch. It's actually used in Greek literature to speak of an animal chewing its, its food. And so it's getting very graphic and more offensive. It's bad enough to even talk even figuratively about eating his flesh. Now it's about munching on it, chomping on it, uh, and drinking blood. So it's obvious that he's choosing his terms in such a way as to offend these people. He could have been more delicate about it. But he's obviously trying to drive away anybody who can possibly be driven away. And he succeeds. And this is a very different philosophy of evangelism than we would have today. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not the one who went begging to people with cap in his hand, please accept me, please join my church, please be part of my movement, please, you know, believe in me. He did urge people to believe in him because that was their only salvation. But he didn't uh, allow people to do it who weren't so inclined. And people who were able to be put off, he tended to put them off. Remember the rich young ruler? The man comes and he's eager to be part of Jesus' movement. He comes running to Jesus, eager to you know, find out how to participate with what Jesus is doing. He says, good master, what thing must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Then he says, if you want to have life, keep the commandments. That would put most people off, but not this man. He was a, a law-abiding Jew. He was a conscientious Jew. He said, I've kept the commandments since from my youth. And Jesus said, well, you lack one thing. Take all that you have and sell it and give it to the poor. Then you'll have life. You come follow me then. Now, the man wasn't willing to do that and went away sorrowful. And Jesus certainly would have liked to have that man follow him. But he didn't change the terms for him. He watched him go. Now, we wouldn't do that if we were, uh, you know, preaching the gospel, trying to get someone to join our church, especially a rich man. We'd really like, we like rich men in our church. <laughs> Although Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, like getting a camel to go through the eye of a needle. We seem to think uh, it should be made easy as possible for them, and so we want them to come. We don't want them to make any serious sacrifices, or we don't want to uh, put, do anything to put them off. But Jesus takes a rich man and tells him, get rid of all you have, and then come be my disciple. The man doesn't want to, and Jesus doesn't modify the terms. He just lets the man go. Here, these people, obviously Jesus has already assessed these people. They are not the right kind of people for his movement, but they're following him out for wrong motives. He fed them the day before with free food, and he told them the only reason they came after him the next day was because they wanted more free food. They, he said they had no interest in the spiritual meaning of what he was about. And so, in this conversation, he's doing everything he can to drive them away. And he does succeed in driving most of them away. The disciples stay, which means that they could not be driven away. There are people who are being called of God and cannot be made to leave. And Jesus had said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And, uh, you know, the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out, in verse 37. And he said... In verse 45, at the end of verse 45, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. He also says in verse 65, which we've not yet gotten to, he said, therefore I said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Now nobody is going to be coming to Jesus unless the Father is drawing that person. 
That means that person is convicted of their sin. That means that person is convinced that Jesus is who he claims to be. This conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. And that conviction must exist prior to a person coming to Christ. And so Jesus was not afraid that he might drive people away who otherwise should stay because he knew that if his father was drawing them, they were hungry. They were desirous. They, were, they would believe. They had heard and learned from the Father. So even if they don't understand what he's talking about, they're not going anywhere because they've been drawn to him uh, by their commitment to God and by the conviction that he is who he says he is. The other people in whom God has not apparently been doing that kind of a work are not only uh, free to leave, he wants them to leave. Jesus doesn't want to have a large movement made up of people who aren't true disciples. He wants to have a pure movement made up of people who are true disciples. Jesus never was trying to build a large church, though it would not, it would, it would not displease him to have a large church if all the people in it were disciples. You see, our philosophy is we get a bunch of people, as many people as possible, into church on any pretext. Hope they come, hope they stay, hope they get locked in, get involved in the programs of the church for a long time, and, and over time, we hope that some of them may get saved. The ones who don't, of course we're sorry they don't get saved, but we still like them to stay. A crowd tends to draw a crowd. If you have a lot of people there, it's going to help other people want to come because everyone feels, likes to feel they're part of the big movement. So we like to have a big crowd of people. Obviously, we who are evangelicals would like for them to all be real Christians. We think everyone should be a real Christian, and we'd love for all the people in the church to be that. But if they're not, we don't want them to go away. We've got good use for them. After all, they still have money, and they still are warm bodies that fill the pews and, and, uh, and looks like a good-sized crowd, and it gives the church a respectable feel. It's very embarrassing to have a church that you go to and all, you know, the, half the seats are empty. You know, a visitor comes in there and he thinks, wow, this church must not be very good or else there wouldn't be so many empty seats. Preacher must not be very good. Music must not be very good. I think I'll try to slip out of here before the meeting starts. I don't want to stay because this probably isn't going to be very good. But if they walk into a place that's packed out, they say, well, there must be something happening here. I think I'm going to stay. So that's what we want. We like to have that psychological draw on people. And, uh, and Jesus just wasn't interested in that. He didn't have any ego wrapped up in this thing. He just wanted to find his father's sheep. And he knew they would hear his voice. And they would follow him. And he, anyone else who was following him who wasn't one of his sheep, he did all he could to make them go away. And I, I believe that Jesus' idea was that the fellowship of the saints should be a fellowship of true Christians. That a gathering of the church is supposed to be the church. And the church is made up of people who are born again and following Christ. And I'm, I'm, I, I think it's a sad thing that many churches just see themselves as evangelistic outreaches, so they hope that lots of non-Christians will come so they might hear the gospel. The early church never asked people to come to their church to hear the gospel. They went out to where the people were and preached the gospel. They weren't even invited to church unless they were converted. You convert them first, then you bring them to church, because that's where the body is, and that's You've got to have some place where Christians can meet. If the, if the church meeting is open to all people saved and unsaved, then where are you going to find some place for the Christians to be? If the meeting is catering to the people who have the lowest common denominator of interest, the sermons have to remain very milquetoast. The sermons have to remain very pabulum and very, you know, uh, geared to the person who's either, you know, has very, very little... Bible knowledge or maybe isn't even saved. And so week after week, the church caters to this crowd that they're encouraging to come, and the people who are actually saved are starving to death because they're beyond the point of needing baby food, and they're not getting anything but baby food. And so the church isn't the church. The church is a big evangelistic meeting. Well, but where is the church then? Where are the meetings for the Christians? Where is the discipleship going to happen? if not in the gatherings of the Christians. So Jesus had a different philosophy. Let's get rid of all these people who aren't really committed. Let's just keep the people around us who want to follow, who want to be disciples. 
And so he used what is certainly offensive language, and deliberately so, almost, almost to the point of being inappropriate, though you wouldn't want to say anything Jesus said was inappropriate. But, I mean, it gets to the point where talking about chomping on his flesh and drinking his blood is not even a very, um, what should we say, it's not a very accurate depiction of the thing he's talking about. You know, he's not really talking about eating with your teeth and drinking blood. He's, he's really talking about the same thing as when he says, you have to eat me as the living bread. Which means, of course, as, as a, a body is nourished by ingesting nourishing food. So our eternal life comes by our spiritually ingesting Jesus, as he had said early on. In fact, this whole discussion began when he said to them in verse 27, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to everlasting life. That is, you need to not live by bread alone, but also by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now that analogy is not too difficult. It's not hard to see an analogy between eating for your body and eating the word of God for your soul. When it gets down to chewing on flesh and drinking blood, I mean, that the imagery gets bizarre. And it's almost like Jesus seems to choose that imagery. Like I said, it's almost not even appropriate because it's not, it's not really, a, it doesn't picture very clearly what is really suggested here. And uh, yet he obviously is going to the point of, uh, uh, to, he's going over the top to get these people to go away. <laughs> That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get them to go away if they can. And I, I believe that uh, it'd be, we'd consider it very risky today if we tried to get people to leave the church if they could be made to do so. Um, I, you know, some people have asked me, you know, how can you get more people to go on the mission field? And my answer is, how can we get less people to go? The mission field is full of bad examples of Christians. Small-minded, denominational, jealous, territorial people with their families out of order and their, their tempers you know, not sanctified. I mean, there's a lot of good missionaries. I'm not, I'm not describing all the missionaries. I'm describing the superfluity of missionaries. There's, there are people that God calls on the issue, like Paul and Barnabas. I'll tell you what, I'd rather have a dozen Paul and Barnabas out there than a thousand people who went because some, they heard some guilt trip you know, from the pulpit, from someone saying, we need to go out and reach the people of India. Well, we do, but the ones who have to do it are the ones that God calls to be there and gives the gifting and the heart for it. And, you know, when, if someone says, how do you get people to go to the mission field? I almost want to try to persuade people not to go. Because if they are called by God, they will go no matter how hard I try to get them to stop. And the people who aren't called ought not. And it's sort of that way with the church itself. How do you get people more to come to church? Well, get them saved, I suppose. The ones who aren't saved, you should probably ask them to go somewhere else so that they don't bring reproach on the name of Christ by being attached to the body and not being Christian. I read in our Bible form on the, online recently, someone put the question, why do Christians get as many divorces and not, as not a Christian? And frankly, I think the reason is because most Christians aren't Christians. If you're a Christian, you don't go out and divorce your spouse without grounds. And most Christians are probably married to other Christians who don't go out and give them grounds. I mean, I hope. Now, if they do, then that's the problem too, you know? If, if, uh, if there's a husband or wife that goes out and commits adultery and they're supposed to be a Christian, well, I don't see how they can be a Christian, really. I mean, I'm not saying Christians never fall into sin occasionally, but, but I mean, how could somebody be a follower of Jesus Christ and think they can have an affair on their spouse? Or how can somebody be a follower of Jesus Christ and think that they can just ditch their family? It just, it's unthinkable to a person who loves Jesus. But it's not unthinkable to half the people who go to church. And so we have people in the church, the statistics show that their families are breaking up as much as others. And the testimony of Christ is shot to bits. And uh, that's only because those people shouldn't have been there until they were ready to follow Jesus anyway. Now some people who really follow Jesus do fall away. 
some people really belong in the church, and yet, nonetheless, they someday they fall, they do things. David was a true believer, and he fell, but he repented. In other words, he still had a commitment to following God, even though he fell out of weakness and foolishness, he still repented because he loved God. If Christians sin and then repent, it's a different thing than people who just sin because they don't have any commitment to obeying God in the first place. And so Jesus was not looking for an inflated crowd to make his movement seem credible. He wanted to find his father's real children and bring them back to the Father. And these people were not them, for the most part. And so he wanted them to just go away. Right. And he said, in verse 15, whoever chomps on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now, before we go further and see the response of the people, let's deal with this issue that has been so contentious throughout most of church history, and that is, what does he mean, eat his flesh and drink his blood? Obviously, through much of church history, the Roman Catholic Church held the uh, monopoly on Christian doctrine, because they held the monopoly on church. There wasn't any other church that could survive against them. Now, I say... I'm talking about in Europe, in the Western world, where our ancestors came from for the most part. But, uh, of course, in the East and in Africa and so forth, there were different branches of the church that were never under the popes, never had any connection with the Roman Catholic Church. We don't hear much about them because they aren't the ones that our ancestors were a part of. But, you know, when you read church history, you mainly read about the church in the West. The church in the East that was in India and Syria and Assyria and Babylon, places like that, they, were, they had entirely different things going on. But certainly, the Western Church has always, until uh, at least the Reformation, suggested that Jesus is talking about literally taking his flesh and blood into your body through your mouth. Now, how in the world is that done? He's not here anymore. Oh, well, it's, it's magic. There, you know, when you take the Eucharist, the bread turns into the body of Jesus and the wine turns into the blood of Jesus. And this is called transubstantiation. The substance trans changes into something else. And that is the Catholic doctrine, and I have many conversations with Catholics about this, and they always bring this up. And of course, one other passage, and you know what that passage is, it's when Jesus was at the Last Supper. And he passed around the elements of the Passover meal, and he said, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. This cup is my blood, which is poured out for you. So they say, look at that. Twice Jesus talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And it's very clear in the second instance, at the end of his life, at the Last Supper, that he's referring to taking the communion meal, taking the Eucharist, as it's called. By the way, Eucharist is just the ordinary Greek word for thanksgiving. The Roman Catholics use the term for what we might call communion or the Lord's Supper or something like that. We have different names for things. But the Eucharist, or the Mass, as they call it, is uh, the taking of the wafer and the taking of wine and believing that those things really are, literally, the blood and the, and the body of Jesus. Now, is this what Jesus was saying? Probably it's pretty close to what his listeners thought he was saying, which is why they got upset and left. But... It is not what he was saying. For one thing, he could not possibly on this occasion have been talking about the Eucharist for the simple reason that it had not been instituted yet and it would not for another year. This was Passover. It was a year from this time, the next Passover, that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper and said, this is my body, this is my blood from now on. When you eat and drink of this, you remember my body, my blood, remember my death. 
So there's no way that these people who he says were currently, some of them were eating his flesh, drinking his blood, it's present tense, were, they weren't taking the Eucharist. There was no mass. There was no priest officiating at a mass. And so when he says, uh, whoever, for example, verse 54, whoever eats, that's present tense. Whoever is eating my flesh, whoever is drinking my blood, has present tense, eternal life. He's talking to people a full year before there was ever a Eucharistic meal. And yet some were already eating his flesh and drinking his blood in the sense that he's describing and were having eternal life. This is a present phenomenon. His disciples were already there. And so he's not talking about something that would be a ritual set up at some future time, but something that was going on right now for some of these people, and uh, that which set one group apart from the others, that one group was eating his flesh and drinking his blood, the other was rejecting it. So it, it'd be uh, you know, impossible that this verse was talking about the Last Supper unless it's by way of anticipation, but that then would have to be in the future tense because... This was not happening yet. Now, as far as the Last Supper itself, when Jesus said, this bread, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. This cup is my blood, which is poured out for you. Well, was it? Was it literally so? Was his blood at that moment poured out from his body into the cup? No, his blood was going to be poured out the next day, but it wasn't yet. How could they be drinking his blood that was poured out that night when he had not poured out any blood yet. How could they be eating his broken body that night when he had not yet had his body broken? That was going to happen the next day. Are we to suppose that Jesus, you know, chunks of his body came out into his hands and, and, and he gave them? I'm not meaning to try to be irreverent, but uh, obviously every part of his body was still intact. It was not broken for them, not yet. Every bit of his blood was still in his veins. None of it had been poured out. It wasn't poured out into the glass. So unless he magically turned bread into flesh, even if he did, how would that be his flesh? You know, if he, you know, if he could turn rocks into bread, I suppose you could turn bread into human flesh, but how would that be his flesh? His flesh was all part of him. It wasn't, none of it was missing. That was not his flesh in, their hand, in his hands. That was not his blood in the cup. And he was not saying that it was. You see, the Passover meal that he was slightly modifying with, uh, you know, for his disciples' sake, was had a, a point at which bread was ceremonially broken, with ritual uh, sayings over it, and eaten. And the same thing with the passing of several cups during the ceremony. When the bread was broken by the host at the table at Passover, the traditional thing to say was. This bread is the bread of affliction that our fathers suffered in Egypt. This bread is the bread of affliction that our fathers had in Egypt? Obviously not. What he means is this bread represents that. It reminds us of that. The bread, that bread they ate was at every Passover meal had not been around back when their fathers were in Egypt. It was new, fresh bread that they baked probably that day or that week. It, was, it had no connection physically to anything they ate in Egypt. In fact, he's not even talking about something they ate in Egypt. He's talking figuratively. They ate the bread of affliction. It means that they were afflicted. It's a figure of speech. He's not really saying this bread is the bread our fathers ate, but, but that's how you'd speak it. That's the way of speaking, just as... Uh, if, if I was showing you my family on Facebook page and showed you a picture of all my kids, I said, now this is my older son here, and this is my younger son, and these are my two daughters in the middle, and this is my oldest daughter here. You say, really, that's them? I thought your children would be human, not just mm -hmm. pictures on a screen. Well, I mean, these pictures represent them. You know, they, they aren't them. My, my children actually breathe and live and so forth, and the pictures on the screen don't do that. That's not really them there. That's a picture of them. That's an image of them. But I would still say, now that's him and that's her. And that, we say, this is my son. It doesn't mean that's really my son. That just means that's a picture of my son. If I'm giving you instructions, showing you a map, and I say, now this line here, this is Interstate 5. No, it isn't. It's an it's a ink line on a page. It's not Interstate 5. 
but it represents Interstate 5. This is Interstate 5 means this represents it. We talk that way all the time, and so did they in biblical times. When David said, oh, that I could drink again from the well of, uh, in Bethlehem, three of his mighty men broke through a Philistine barrier, drew uh, water from that well, and brought it to David. And David couldn't bring himself to drink. He poured out the water and said, this water is the blood of those men who hazard their lives for me. This water is the blood of those men? Is that right? This was David saying, this water is now transubstantiated into the blood. No. This water is the blood means this, this, this water reminds me of or represents or has the significance to me of. It doesn't mean it is really blood. He's not making a statement of transubstantiation where he said this water is the blood of these men. Anywhere that Jesus said, this cup is my blood. It isn't. It's wine. And you could prove it, too, because, you know, if you, uh, if you went to a Catholic church and ate uh, the communion there, and then you went and had your stomach pumped, you could just check. And see, did it turn into flesh, or is it still made of wheat? Is it still made of flour? Yep, it didn't turn into flesh. It's still bread. It does not change its substance. Now, Roman Catholics have answers to those kinds of things. But as you might perhaps imagine, they are desperate answers. I've read them. Uh, they are. They, they certainly get into the, the, the magical aspect, the superstitious aspect.